Hey, thanks for joining us for another Extensions, man. If you're watching all these, honestly, you're awesome. I hope they're helpful to you. And I believe if you're watching this, it's because you're hungry for God's word. And um, I've been really feeling this scripture, right? Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled. So I hope that God just does special things in your life as you watch this. And uh, as we're getting into this one, I'm going to really focus around Acts chapter 3 and 4. And I would tell you that uh, there's two sermons you could watch. One uh, was called Cha-Cha Jesus, and the other one was like a bonus issue that we put out uh, called um, School of the Spirit. That's what it's called, School of the Spirit. If you watch those two, they'll cover the entirety of Acts 3 and 4 on like a bigger kind of picture look. This is going to be some of the nitty-gritty details where I'm going to go through, cover stuff like Peter's sermon, stuff like that. And then the last six verses in Acts 4 that I haven't covered yet that's where we'll get here. So let's recap a little bit. Let's make sure we're on the same page. You could stop here, go watch those other ones if you haven't. If not, I'll give you a little recap if you're just already here and you want to do it. Watch it, listen. So here we go. Peter and John, I want to recap it starting Acts uh, 3. If you go Acts 3 and a verse 1, Peter and John, they're on their way to pray as they always would uh, to the temple. And they come across uh, this beggar, this lame beggar. It says that he was lame since birth for 40 years. So we don't know exactly how long he was at this gate. It was a gate called Beautiful, but a long time for sure, because he's definitely uh, been unable to move lame for 40 years. They end up healing him, right? It's the iconic statement. Silver and gold I do not have, Peter said, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. So the dude does. He doesn't just walk. He gets up. He's going ballistic. He's jumping. He's running. He's shouting. He's singing. He's praising God, and he's getting a lot of people's attention. So all the people start gathering, and they're like, what is going on right now? Whoa, this is the dude that was lame. Like, we've known him. He's been here for years. I mean, he's like, what, 40 years old? He's been out here begging every time we're coming in to try to give to the Lord. We're giving him alms along the way, too. And now he's running, he's jumping, he's going crazy. What is going on? So the crowd keeps gathering. They're like, what's all the ruckus? We got to know what is going on right now. So Peter sees that as an opportunity to preach. Crowd gathers time to preach. So it's like when we witness to somebody, when we when we give a testimony, when we evangelize, it's usually one-on-one. When a crowd gathers, it's called now preaching because we're not declaring the word of God to multiple or multitudes of people, okay? So I love this. Um, what I'm doing right now, speaking to you, public speaking in, in terms of like the, the, the textual, scriptural standpoint is called homiletics, right? So I'm, I'm delivering this through teaching, or if I'd, I was preaching, I'm doing homiletics. This is what Peter's about to do. But it's called hermeneutics when he's taking the, the writings of the Old Testament law, in this case, and he's applying it to the people of that time. It's called, he'd be doing it hermeneutically. And maybe you don't care about this, but let me just point this out for a second. Peter, not a preacher, not trained to be a preacher, he's just a fisherman. The dude hermeneutically breaks it down. The dude homiletically breaks preaches. Those are just big words of saying the dude preaches an amazing sermon. And I, I want to give you a little bit of insight and show you why. Even if you're not interested in preaching, what he breaks down is just amazing. Not only how it applied to these people, uh, which would be exegetically how it applied to them, but also hermeneutically how it even applies to us. So let me start at verse 12. When Peter saw this, he said to them, all the people looking on, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us is it by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? Like, what do you think? We did this? We didn't do this. This is Jesus. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. I want to point out four quick thoughts from this right here that blows my mind. Hopefully, he's going to help you a little bit. Number one, Peter intentionally opens by referencing the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He says, the God of our fathers. Why? Because just as today, there's a lot of different gods, lowercase g's, that people worship. We serve the one true God, Jesus, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God, three parts in one. That's our God. But he's making it clear to them, listen, I want to make it clear. I'm talking about the God of Israel. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. When I talk about Jesus, he said, I want to connect it to the God of Israel. The God that you know of, number one. Number two, Peter intentionally, I'm going to keep using this word intentionally because um, I just think when it comes to preaching, if we go out there spontaneously, 
uh, and just say whatever, that's one thing. But when we got there empowered by the Holy Spirit and then knowing, in his case, it was the law, or in our case, it'd be like knowing the Bible, God's word, it's not spontaneous. It's spirit-led intentionality with God's word. So number two, Peter intentionally connects, you know Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of Israel? Well, I want to connect Abraham, who's known as the father of our nations, of many nations. I'm going to connect him to, what does he call? The glorified servant, Jesus. Number three, let me break now, now go to the glorified servant, Jesus. Peter intentionally refers to Jesus, not just, he could have said the most high Jesus. He could have said the miracle worker, Jesus. But what do you say? The servant, Jesus. Now, we could say, well, uh, is he saying that because Jesus said that the Son of Man, referring to himself, uh, uh, as the prophet Daniel referred to this thought as the Son of Man would come, you know, the glory and the clouds, all that, that Jesus called himself Son of Man. He said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give himself as a ransom for many. Is that why he did it? No. That'd be a great reason, but that's not why he did it. He refers to him as servant Jesus because the concept of the servant of the Lord was a huge concept in this culture with the Israeli people that they understood from the prophet Isaiah. The servant of the Lord is something that the prophet Isaiah talks about in multiple chapters. Let me just look at Isaiah 53. He talked about this. Isaiah 53, verse 11. By his knowledge, his, capital H, meaning God's knowledge, the righteous one, all caps, that's a person, my servant, look at that, a person. So we would break it down and understand this. The Father, His knowledge, by His knowledge, the Father's knowledge, He points to Jesus, the Son, the righteous one, my, meaning Father's servant, meaning the Father's Son, in this case it breaks down for us. My servant will justify the many, for He will bear their wrongdoings. Number four, let me break down the last piece of this, because I'm using Isaiah 53 now to connect to verses 12 and 13 of chapter 3 of Acts. This verse in Isaiah 53, it's setting up Jesus as capital S, servant, not just a servant, but it's like the servant and the righteous one of God. But it's truly even bigger than that. He's using this thought, the last, what is it? Five words here. Has glorified his servant, Jesus, right? Five words. Let me just stop there. He's using those five words, or especially servant Jesus, two words, to set up the rest of verse 13. Because look at Isaiah 53, 11. Let me just show it to you one more time, and I want you to catch this as I read it again. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, for he will bear their wrongdoings. That the servant Jesus is going to bear the sins of the world. We know it as he went on the cross. You read Isaiah 53, you see the whole narrative of Jesus going to the cross. Like a sheep before a shearers, shearers is silent, by his stripes were healed. He was crushed for our you know, iniquities, all that stuff, right? But it says here that the servant Jesus is going to bear the wrongdoings. Peter's using the last two words, servant Jesus, as a sort of um, transition, a segue into the next section here, verses 13 to 15. Now look at those verses. Bearing their wrongdoings, keep that in mind now as we go back to Acts 13, Acts 3, verse 13. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. So Pilate's like, I'm going to let him free, but you still wanted him dead. Why? Let's go back to Isaiah 53, because he was going to bear their wrongdoings. You disowned, look how it says it here again, connection to Isaiah 53, verse 11. You disown the holy and righteous one. So it calls him again, the righteous one. And ask that a murderer be released to you. That's, that's Barabbas. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this. Listen, we, we knew he was in the tomb. We we're freaking out because we're like, Jesus is dead. What do we do now? And Peter and John, the same ones that are here with the lame beggar, they're the ones that race to the tomb to find that the tomb is empty. Then Jesus reveal, reveals himself to, to, to Peter and to the women and to all of the disciples without Thomas and then with Thomas. And then they were in Galilee and then it was at the, the sea, of, uh, sea of Galilee there. And then it was uh, as Peter's fishing, then Peter's reinstated. And then it's over 500, Paul writes about. It's like, we were there. We were witnesses. We saw it. But specifically, it refers to servant Jesus in verse 13. And then when you go to Isaiah 53, it refers to the righteous one, my servant. And then now look at, we just read it here now in verse 13 to 15 of Acts 
three, it says holy and righteous one. So righteous one connects to Isaiah 53, but look how it says holy and righteous one. So he's saying like the holy one. Now this, the implications in saying this is huge. You have to understand this. Holy one, to call someone the holy one like this. He's saying Jesus, the holy one. That's used over 40 times in the Old Testament. And it's only used in reference to give a title, a high, glorious, sovereign, majestic title to Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of God that they wouldn't even state from their lips. When they wrote it, they would write Y-H-W-H. They wouldn't even write his full name, much less say it. So in, in, in Peter calling Jesus the Holy One, he's saying that Jesus, his name, Yeshua, he's saying that Yeshua is in complete connection as the Holy One to Yahweh. Of the same, both God, Father to the Son. He is holy and he is the righteous one. So Peter continues on here and he's explaining that, listen, y'all shouldn't have done this. This was ignorant, he says in the next verse. You shouldn't have done it. The leaders shouldn't have done it. Y'all were in cahoots. This was wrong, but he said it had to be done. It had to be done because we had to fulfill what the prophets said. Now they believe the prophets. They believe everything that is in the Old Testament, we would call it, and at that time it was like the law and the prophets, they'd call it. They believed all of it. They followed it very closely. So he's now connecting, listen, y'all shouldn't have done this to Jesus, but it had to be done because the prophet said it had to be done. Now Jesus, the holy one, the righteous one, the servant, he's coming, he's fulfilled everything that you guys did against him. He fulfilled the prophet saying it'd be done in the first place. I want you to remember this. Jesus of Nazareth is not new information to these people. This is not the first time they're hearing about him. They crucified him. Not Maybe not all of them, but many of them were around when he was crucified. Many of them still going to the temple. They're seeing Jesus coming through the streets. They saw him up on Golgotha on the hill. This is not new to them. Jesus is not new. And the reason I say that is because this is all taking place only four years after. So we're right here in Acts 3, let's say Acts 3, Acts 4. It's four years after Jesus died, rose again, and ascended to the right hand of the Father. So four years after his death and resurrection, these people would have still been around. This is not the first time they're hearing or knowing about Jesus. They had heard about it, but it's kind of like it almost had passed away because he wasn't around anymore. So now, just like today, as Jesus is not walking anymore today, we got to talk about him. Although it's been uh, roughly 1,993 years ago since his death and resurrection, give or take in history, but according to the Jewish calendar, this last Easter would have marked on that Sunday uh, here in 2023 that he would have resurrected 1,993 years ago, we still got to talk about him just like it was four years ago. So here's Peter and John. They're there in the midst of all these witnesses. Why are they bringing all these connections to the Old Testament prophets, to all of these different things? Because they're saying, listen, you know the facts about what happened to Jesus. You were here when he did miracles and preached. You were here when he was crucified. You already know the facts of that. He was here. He walked the earth. He was real. But now I'm trying to bring in the facts of Jesus being here with the truth of what the prophet said to build the case for Christ, to build the case that he's not just some random holy man. He is the Holy One. He's the Messiah. He's the righteous one of God. Yeshua connected to Yahweh. He is the one who was and is, and we're going to tell you, and is to come as well. He's Peter right here connecting the case for Christ. He tells him in the next uh, verse here, verse 19, I'll jump to, um, very simple message. John the Baptist said it. Jesus said it. Peter says it. I'll tell you today. Repent. Very simple. What do you do when it's time to come to Jesus? What do you do with all this? You repent. You recognize that you've fallen short of the, of the glory of God and you're in need of saving. And you repent to turn from your ways. He says, repent then and turn to God. So that your sins may be wiped out, may be blotted clean, may be like completely erased, sharpied over, completely annihilated. So that your sins will be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. I think about when Isaiah uh, prophesied that it was going to spring up, a new thing was going to come, a refreshing thing was going to come. Jesus is the new thing. 
He says, so that refreshing may come from the Lord and that we may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. That's a, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Even Jesus? Why does he say it that way? What he's saying here, in our English language, to read it this way, it doesn't quite make sense, but what he's saying is, I'm here talking about that he may send the Messiah, but let me make it clear that the Messiah who I'm talking about is Jesus. Even Jesus is who I'm talking about. Like I'm talking about Jesus is the Messiah. They're synonymous of one another. So then Peter brings uh, what I'd call as like Babe Ruth has been on deck and he brings the big hitter in now. It's the home run derby. It's time for me to make something that is going to hit so hard and be so specific to them that it's going to finally drive home the point. So he brings in the big hitter, the revered prophet, the one that they knew without a shadow of a doubt had heard from God, had helped deliver the law, had helped deliver the Ten Commandments, had helped lead them through the wilderness, who had had brought them to the point where they could even receive the promised land now that Joshua would lead them. But who is the one that when you speak this name, sheesh, it's a lot of weight, Moses. So right here now, Peter's going to quote from Deuteronomy chapter 18. So I'm going to read you Acts 3, 22 to 23, but it's actually quoting Deuteronomy 18, something Moses had said. For Moses said, okay, they all stopped now. They're like, what? Okay, Moses? Okay, now we're listening. Jesus, you have our partial attention. But Moses, what did, Mo what did Moses have to say? Because he was their prophet they hung on to. It's like, uh, not the same, but trying to give an analogy here. It's like in Islam, the Muslims hang on to their prophet, Muhammad. But for us, Moses, the most humble man, Moses, a powerful man of God, Moses, a servant of the Most High, of the Righteous One, of the Holy One, of Jesus, right? So Jesus maybe hadn't walked the earth as man, but he was still God from the very beginning. Moses was a man of God. Different. Hey, Mohammed, not the same. But I'm trying to give you a correlation of the, the reverence they had, right? They have this revering for Moses. So what did Moses have to say? For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, meaning he's going to come right from the Jewish people. He's going to come as an Israelite. He's going to come, we now know, from the tribe of Judah. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. So he's quoting here Deuteronomy 18. He's making it clear that the Holy One that Moses said would follow him, yeah, that's Jesus. The, the one that after Abraham would bring the true promise to the nations, not just Abraham would bring the promise to create many nations, but Jesus would be the promise that would become for those nations, that the Jews would be the first one that could receive the true promise of God, Jesus, his one and only son. Before us Gentiles would ever get to hear about him, the Jewish people, Peter is saying, you'll first get to hear. The one that would follow Moses would be Jesus. The promise that would follow Abraham would be Jesus. And this whole sermon, Peter references Abraham, Moses, even the prophet Samuel. And he's doing it in order to point them that, to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the prophets. It's Jesus. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees, they roll up. They came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. So they're like mid-preaching. Now you can feel these people rolling up like what's about to go down. And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. You, you need to note this. At this moment, they're not mad or even focused on the fact that Peter and John are followers of Jesus. That was not their problem. They're not even focused on the fact that they're preaching to their people. Like, hey, we're the ones that preach to these people. That's not what they're focused on. Why were they mad? They're frustrated because they're proclaiming that in Jesus, there is the resurrection of the dead. Because see, the Sanhedrin was made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. So Sadducees, they didn't believe in the afterlife and the resurrection of the dead. They didn't, they didn't look at it all that way. So Peter is preaching things that's now going to start causing a rift in the Sanhedrin because the Pharisees do believe it, but the Sadducees don't believe it. And maybe the Pharisees don't believe that Jesus is the resurrection of the dead, right? But they believe the possibility of resurrection of the dead. Sadducees don't believe any of it. So now a rift is occurring. Why did Peter and John get thrown into prison? 
because of a dangerous idea, because of a dangerous thought, because of dangerous resurrection. This thought is the reason that they get thrown into prison. But they're like, I don't care. You can't stop the truth from spreading. You can't stop the message from spreading. The miracle is too known for anybody to deny it. The dude was 40 years old. Now the message is in company with the miracle now. They're in partnership together. You take a message and a miracle in the same combination, it is a deadly punch to hell, let me tell you. So like, you can throw us in prison. doesn't matter. You can't stop the message. So you got to watch the, the other two messages, Cha Cha Jesus and, and, and School of the Spirit, to get the rest of the story. I'm just going to jump to the punchline here. It didn't matter if, they're, if the messengers were in, in jail because the message was spreading. Do you realize here, realize here at this point, 34 AD, four years after Jesus had ascended into heaven, the church now had grown to somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 people? But why don't you look beyond the number? In Jerusalem, this is Jerusalem alone, four to 500 homes, 30 to 50 people in each home. Think if, let's like, just say on a high end, you're like a family of five, six, seven. Now you have 30 to 50 people in your house. You waking up together every day, people that were strangers, but now they're family. This is a pop and party. This is a Jesus party. Let me tell you, you know what was happening in these homes? They were exploding with fellowship. They're exploding with prayer, worship, accountability. They're eating meals together and breaking bread. They're having fun together. Miracles are happening in their midst. 30 to 50 people in every one of these homes. It's just about to be crazy in this house. And then look what it says in verse 32. All of this is happening in these homes. And it says that all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of of the Lord Jesus. I love that. The very thing, the preaching of the resurrection specifically that was getting them in trouble, the resurrection of Jesus that was getting them in trouble, that was throwing them in prison, it's the thing they couldn't stop talking about. It wasn't just with great power they continued to preach and testify about Jesus. It's about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, knowing they could get thrown in jail again, that stuff could go down again. But listen, like this is the thing that's setting people free. It's not just the death that forgives sins. It's the resurrection power that keeps us free from sin. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that busted Jesus out of that tomb that keeps me from going back to my old way of living, keeps me set free in Jesus. It continues here that, and the grace of, uh, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. All that were in, uh, that all, sorry, in them, all that were, Sorry, I'm going to read this again. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy person among them. For from time to time, those who own land or houses sold them. Man, selling your land, selling your house. They brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. Look at the trust in God's leadership. This is, this is important. And it was distributed to anyone who was in need. If, if, if you read this and if you watch the messages, Acts 4, verse 31, right before we got to what we just read here about how they're all one in heart and mind, it says that the, the, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and the place was shaken. The result of the Holy Spirit being poured on the church was that there was greater community, sharing of possessions, unity in their purpose together, encouragement, prayer and praise, falling in love with the teaching of the apostles, God's word, being equipped and a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. And we just read it. And no one was in need among them. It wasn't this person's rich, this person's poor. It wasn't, well, I'm going to have a lot and I'm going to have a little. It's that we're going to look after everybody. We're going to take care of each other. We're going to sell everything necessary. We're going to make sure that there's no needy people in our midst. Now, this is a setup, I would say, slightly unfortunately. Uh, but again, it causes the church to grow. If you want to read ahead, read in Acts 5. This setup right here that there's no need of people, they're selling all their stuff, they're living in this kind of unity, this is a setup for Acts 5. I think like the first 11 verses. There's the story about Ananias and Sapphira. I'll do another teaching on that eventually, but read ahead. Unfortunately, this is kind of like a, a foreshadowing to what's going to happen in the next chapter. But it was for the strength of the church. God did a great work through it. Let me end it right here with the last two verses. Give you a little cameo here. A little shot of somebody important. Verse 36 and 37. 
Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas, uh, he is very pivotal to the book of Acts. You see him here in Acts 4. He'll be referenced in Acts 9, Acts 11, Acts 13, Acts 14, Acts 15. He ends up becoming an apostle. He ends up traveling, doing missionary work. He's used in very, very important roles. I did an actually an extension that you could go watch if you haven't already called um, Where's Saldo? And it's like, hey, where Paul did like Acts 9, and then we don't see him again until Acts 13. Where is he? Well, Barnabas was very important there in Acts 9. And I talked about Acts 9, it was like 19 to 31 in that extension. I talked about how Barnabas brought Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the apostle, before the rest of the apostles, Peter and all that. And Peter is like, they're like skeptical, like, I don't know if we can trust this dude. I mean, this dude, you realize what he's done in the church? I don't know if we, we can't have him around. And Barnabas vouches for him. It's like, you need to trust me. This dude has been changed. He's repented. He's been transformed. He's filled with the Holy Spirit now. There was a miracle that took place where he was blind, but now he could see. Barnabas didn't even know what Paul would go on to do for the name of Jesus, that he'd flip the world upside down. Barnabas didn't even know. But who is he? Barnabas, the son of encouragement, was used to unify the current apostles with a future apostle, and he himself would become an apostle. To be what? Let's read again, verse 32. All the believers were one in heart, one in mind. Barnabas was used to make sure that God's people would be one people. And I love that the idea of people, it could be seen as many people. But with God's people, Peter even writes about this later, he goes, once you were not a people, but now you are, and he goes, he goes like chosen royal priesthood. He goes, once you were random, he's saying, but now you're the people of God. Not many people, one people. I just want you to know, very simply, being a follower of Jesus, the beauty of it is not only that you have a personal, individual relationship with Jesus, but you are part of one body through one baptism, one spirit, one God who is Lord of all, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one. You're part of one people. That is the beauty of who we're called to be. That's even what our ministry means. We are one. Though we are many, we form one body or one people. So I don't know where you find yourself uh, today. I don't know if you feel alone. I don't know if you feel like nobody else can relate. Nobody else gets you. You're doing it all by yourself. You're not. I just want you to know that. Come close. Wherever you are, man, if, if you're in this vicinity, we invite you to our church. If you're not, get involved with a church that believes in the power of the Holy Spirit, that believes in community, that believes in, in, in being a body of Christ, one people. Get plugged in. You're not alone. There is so many that are on your team that are for you. You got Jesus. You got me. You got probably a lot of other people around you that don't even, you don't even know to come to. But if you get plugged into God's church, you can come to people in accountability. You talk about how it was exploding with this accountability and community and fun and miracles, prayer. That's what we're supposed to do together. You're part of one people. Let me pray for you so you'll be encouraged in that. Lord, I thank you for the person that is watching or listening right now. I thank you for the call in their life for creating them and that they take the time to take in your word right now and hopefully be more than educated, but they would be stirred in their spirit, Lord, hungry for more of you. I ask that, Lord, this person would recognize that they're not just a person, but they are a people. They're not just a single individual, but they are of one people. Lord, I thank you for them. I bless them and I ask for your glory. They would recognize that they're a part of the greatest thing on planet earth, nothing bigger, nothing greater. No sports team, no government institution is greater than the people, the body, the unity that is your church. Bless them today, Lord, and let them know that, Lord, they're not off on their own and they're not wandering and they're not all over the place, but if they would come close to you, close to your people, they would recognize that we are one. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed, my love.